holderism and the dyna dynamic internet. And to do that, we have a very distinguished panel. And first of all, before we get started, um, I would like to introduce briefly uh, the, the speakers and also to tell you that we have in advance given them uh, a number of questions and I will read them out to you so that you know what they're responding to because otherwise it might be a bit tricky. So uh, to my right hand side, I have uh, Professor um, Christopher S. Yo, and he's the John H. Chestnut Professor of Law, Communication, Computer and Information Science. And he's also the founding director of the Center for Technology, Innovation and Competition at the University of Pennsylvania. And he has emerged as a leading authority on law and technology. And his research focuses on principles of network engineering and imperfect competition uh, that can provide new insights into the regulation of the internet. But if you would like to say something more about yourself, you're of course welcome. <laughs> Uh, near, to my near right is Bill Woodcock, and he entered the field of uh, internet routing research in 1989 already. He looks very young, so that sounds like a longer time than I would have expected ago. Um, he um, has also designed an uh, operating an, an international multi-protocol service provision backbone. He's now currently a trustee of ARIN and uh, uh, a research director for PCE. PCH, sorry. On my left hand side is the initiator of this um, uh, workshop. Uh, Lorenzo Popillo is the execu executive director in the public and regulatory affairs of the uh, unit in uh, Telecom Italia. And he's also affiliated researcher at Columbia Institute for Teleinformation. Uh, next is Olga Cavalli. Cavalli, Cavalli. Uh, um, she's an ICT and internet specialist and she has large experience in project management, market research, competitive analysis, public policy and regulations. She is uh, since 2007 the member of the UN General uh, Se Secretary General's Advisory Group for the Internet Governance Forum as well as uh, Argentina's representative in the GAC of ICANN. Uh, she's also an um, associated professor at the uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires and in the diplomatic career uh, training in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of her country. And she holds a PhD among other uh, degrees um, uh, um, uh, from uh, the university uh, where she's born. Um, last but not least, Sam uh, Pat Paltridge, um, he's a PhD and he is uh, working in the OECD where he currently heads up the telecoms unit of the in the division on information, consumer and communications policy. Um, he's actually one of the founding members of GAC, so that's an honor to have a founding member here in the panel. So thank you very much, all of you, um, to participate in this. So let's move on to the substance. Um, uh, Christopher, Yo, um, we put a number of questions to you together with Lorenzo. Um, it would be the dynamic internet and how it's affecting the network governance processes. The second question is how has internet changed and why do you talk about a dynamic internet? Uh, how is the dynamic internet affecting the network governance process? Do you see the multi-stakeholder model as a reality in the current internet governance system? And this is really the key question, I, I gather. And is the multi-stakeholder model in danger? So, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Lorenzo for, enjoy, uh, for organizing this. Um, so I'd like to start with two quotations that I think frame the way the existing, multi the existing internet community has viewed multi-stakeholder governance and the role particularly of different actors. Uh, David Clark famously said, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. You know, asking, for, you know, really demanding an informal consensus-based idea in which there's no real deference to governmental authority. And perhaps even more polemically, John Perry Barlow said government, this is a paraphrase, but Governments of the world, I come from cyberspace. On behalf of the future, I ask you to leave us alone. You have no sovereignty where we gather. So it's an informal process and a very anti-governmental vision about how the internet would govern itself. And in the beginning, that actually worked out pretty well. I would say the internet really enjoyed a period of benign neglect 
where John Postal and a number of people who are graduate students basically were in charge of a, a large amount of the early work done in the ARPANET. And in fact, John Postal single-handedly assigned out domain names and resolved disputes on a handshake and in a very informal way. And we had a world where uh, a very narrow range of users ran a very narrow range of applications over a narrow range of technologies connected by a narrow range of business relationships. All those statements are now false. Um, in fact, the number of users, it's not just academics and uh, high uh, defense subcontractors and people in that community, it's become much, much larger, much more geographically diverse, and much more diverse in their interests. There's a, a lack of shared values, a lack of a common alignment in their perspective. The applications are no longer just web and email. We now have a variety of applications. People often talk about video because of the bandwidth demands. As it turns out, linear video, pre-recorded video is largely unproblematic. It's really interactive services. But one example I like to give is financial services require actually a very different profile. What they want are microsecond latencies, uh, perfect records, and ex post auditability. Bandwidth they don't need, but they do need other services that the current best efforts of the internet has not been traditionally been designed to, to, to produce. And uh, technologies, we've now worked from a PC connected to a phone line to a whole variety of end user devices, whether they're smartphones or feature phones or tablets, uh, where now the majority of messages are now sent from a, a mobile device and then beyond just a fixed line uh, t a telephone network, we now have a wide variety of networking technologies. And the topology, the old simpler, simple world of tier one, tier two, tier three, through simple pricing mechanisms, pricing has become heterogeneous. The way uh, networks interconnect become heterogeneous. Data centers, CDNs, very, very different approaches in terms of how they're going. And I should, I'm terrible about this because I'm a bad academic in a sense, and this is all drawn on the book that I was published last year, which is the cover which is on the screen. So what does this mean for internet governance? So one of the reasons that, uh, that you can draw out of the literature, primarily associated with Eleanor Ostrom, for which she won the Nobel Prize last year, is that for informal governance to work, you need a certain number of prerequisites to hold. And they, the, it can be encapsulated with an idea of a close-knit community. Close-knit communities can often govern themselves without law. Why? Because they're relatively small in size, if the behavior you're seeking to regulate is highly visible among the people in the community, the community is relatively homogeneous in terms of their interests and backgrounds, and they frequently interact in a wide variety of contexts, so when something goes wrong, you don't just have to go to legal sanctions, you can go to a wide variety of social sanctions. And in fact, this worked fairly well in the very early days of the internet. As, as quaint as it seems, the original means for deterring spam was shaming. You know, back in the Usenet days and all that, there was actually an effective means by which that was possible, and that, in fact, we had these very informal relationships with DNS and the like. And we're finding all these things are starting to break down. Uh, obviously, shaming is no longer curing the spam problem. We're starting to see, you know, disputes coming out where we now have to establish UDRP and other means for resolving these disputes. And uh, one of my favorites is congestion management. You're starting to see different actors for example, start multiple TCP sessions, and for those of you who don't know, there's an arms race going on between the browsers. We all know you can, we've known since the 80s that you can get more bandwidth by starting multiple TCP sessions. The original RFC, R RFC said you could start two, one in each direction, then the browsers went to six, then they went to 12, then they went to, I think it's uh, 18, and they can be done in an arbitrary way, in a way which, because of the centralized nature of this, the ability to get all of everyone well behaved has gone, has become extremely limited. And there are different um, uh, endpoints which don't actually follow the strict speaking of the protocols of how they're expected to behave, and the different actors are pushing very much against the limits. So what does this mean for governance? Well, the first is that um, you know, what these, the basic literature would suggest is that as the network, the community becomes larger and more heterogeneous, uh, we're probably going to have to start relying on more form formal mechanisms. And the one that's generally put forward is multi-stakeholderism, but the funny thing is the content of that is often left extremely vague. The content is extremely important because it's either going to derive from the traditional internet principles of decentralized optimization where each endpoint makes its own decisions, and the, the reason the internet scales is because it can actually optimize for its own interests without taking into account all the other things around. That at the same time makes it very, very difficult to manage. So for example, if you can't get what you want from the network, what we're seeing, for example, is 
instead of internet telephony, we're seeing VOIP, where basically it's happening through specialized services or even private networks using IP-based uh, communications, but something that will assure them the quality of service that they need, which is still the dominant way to do it. And even in the, the wireless world of LTE, voice over LTE still hasn't come about, and that's something that Verizon is, is going to begin deploying next month. But we have a world where they can't quite get all those instruments together. International law traditionally works the same way, where things work by consent. And so these processes actually, if they're going to be truly successful, have to take into account all the different points of view. But on the other hand, they also have to be meaningful and make take, it's supposed to be a process by which the different groups understand the concerns and accommodate the concerns of other parties. In an earlier session, someone had talked about a multi-stakeholder process that failed because the government simply withdrew. Uh, the government was no longer interested, and uh, the hostility towards government that's exist uh, that is reflected in John Perry Barlow's statement, people who work in real multi-stakeholder processes um, need to come to grips with the fact that, in fact, the government's an important actor, they have access to certain venues of inf have information and venues of influence, and that, in fact, they have a legitimizing effect, and, in fact, to the extent to which it's international, you're often depending on some multilateral solution to actually create some part of the enforcement system. And so, in a way, each stakeholder group has to take the others into account, others' interests into account, but the decision-making structure of any multi-stakeholder group is critical. I mean, we've seen this in EU reform, where they move from one country, one vote, to reflecting in the TFEU a different set of interests, or you, know, you can choose any one of another a number of organizations. The voting rules matter. And in fact, they influence the outcomes, and they influence the willingness of different parties to participate. And in fact, uh, we have to think carefully before we just say multi-stakeholderism to understand in this world where informal governance is breaking down, how are we going to structure these processes in ways that, it w that in fact it is optimal for everyone in the self-interest of the various parties on balance uh, to be part of it. As Bill and I were talking, it's not like you have to get every person on board. One of the flexibilities of the multi-stakeholder system is that you can actually get a tipping point consensus which will bring other people along before without actual consent. But you can actually have a more flexible process, but it is one that has to take everyone's interests into account in finding a way, a governance structure, decision-making structure that manages to make that real. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, so the questions for you would be, are these developments increasing the range of benefits or concern associated with the Internet? Do you share the view that the Internet has become more dynamic and less homogeneous? Are these developments increasing the range of benefits or concerns associated with the Internet? How does the technical community see itself in the complex Internet governance environment? Thank okay. you. Um, so I don't have any slides pre uh, prepared here, and uh, I'm going to speak fairly extemporaneously. Um, <coughs> I think the technical community has had uh, a, sort of self a set of self-governance mechanisms for much longer than we've had this, the notion of multi-stakeholderism. And so, because the technical community's governance mechanisms sprang up in advance of the multi-stakeholderism notion, uh, they're not in exactly strict alignment, right? So, um, we can sort of retrofit uh, an explanation for how uh, it is, in fact, multi-stakeholderism, but the fit is not 100% perfect. So, um, I, I would like to sort of draw upon three different examples. Um, one is the way internet exchange points are formed. That's something that I have a lot of experience with. <coughs> one is how the IETF uh, creates technical standards. Again, something that I've done a lot of uh, myself. And the third is um, uh, how internet service providers uh, agree to interconnect with each other. Um, so these are all three very technical uh, governance problems that get solved uh, in ways that uh, predate the notion of multi-stakeholderism, but are sort of exemplars of multi-stakeholderism if you sort of wrap your head around it right. So, um, to start with, uh, in the IETF, there, I there is a very strong preference for those who show up, right? So, yes, it's multi-stakeholderism, but 
you're a stakeholder if you show up and do the work. So the vote is strongest for those who participate most. There are a lot of processes that are like that, right? There are a lot of processes where only the people who show up get a say. Um, the, the flip side of this, however, is you have to decide whether someone who didn't show up can have a veto after the fact, right? So if you have a process like this where, um, you know, people get together in a room and they do the work and they decide what's going to happen and they charge forward and then somebody else shows up later and says, no, I should have been included in this decision. I disagree. It shouldn't be that way. Should that be able to <coughs> stall the process? Obviously, there are good and bad sides to that, right? On, on the one hand, if you say, no, uh, you know, if you weren't there, what you say doesn't matter, right? We're going to go ahead anyway. You can have some very bad decisions. You can get a small number of people meeting in a closed room in secret, doing something bad for society, and there's no check and balance on it. On the other hand, it's really hard to get things done if everybody who comes out of the woodwork later can, you know, throw everything back onto the drawing board. Um, so, you know, the IETF has kind of managed to to resolve that. I mean, not perfectly, but, you know, you do kind of have to be there. You have plenty of opportunities. Nothing happens in secret. It's all out in the open. The cost of participation is very low. So if you don't participate, you don't really have an excuse by which to say, you know, I was excluded from the process and now I'm contributing. Um, the lesson I think that can be learned from the way exchange points get formed is that you don't want to stall your process waiting for 100% unanimity or 100% participation or really full consensus. That um, there will always be people for whom the status quo is preferable or not making some change or development is, is advantageous. And they will always find ways to uh, sort of filibuster a, a project or stall out the decision making process or whatever. And so very often what you need is to not hang your hat on the big guys agreeing with you, right? So with exchange points, what we see is often a situation where there's a range of sizes of participants, you know, a bunch of medium-sized guys, a whole lot of tiny guys, and a couple really big, huge incumbent phone companies. And for the big incumbent phone companies, the creation of the exchange point is almost always a step backwards from their, you know, near monopoly. And so they'd prefer the conversation not happen. If it has to happen, they'd prefer that it have no outcome. If it has an outcome, they'd prefer that the outcome be that nothing be done, right? So they have, they have a, s a series of fallback positions. Um, and at some point, you just have to cut and run and say, you know, that's nice. We get that you don't really want to do anything, but this is going to happen. Um, so to give an example of that, the exchange point in Malaysia, um, it got done on the third try. The first two tries got completely stalled out by Jaring and Telecom Malaysia sort of participating in the process and making sure that it didn't go anywhere. And the third time, finally, everybody else said, no, this time we're going to run the process to conclusion regardless of what you say, so you'd better either come along or get out of the way. And the third, the third example is um, work I did uh, in preparation for a, a paper I wrote for Sam. Um, uh, we surveyed uh, interconnection agreements between internet service providers, between uh, networks. Uh, we looked at, I think, 140-something thousand agreements. Um, so it was fairly comprehensive survey, and it didn't really turn up any complete surprises, but a lot of things were more true than people thought they were, right? So people thought something was true 70% of the time, and it was actually true 99% of the time, that kind of thing. Um, the, the big finding, though, from that is that 99.5% of the time, 
carriers understand, the two networks that are interconnecting, understand the terms of the interconnection so well that they don't need to write them down, right? The 99.5% of the time, everybody is so clear on what the global norms are that nobody even bothers to write it down, right? There's no other kind of contract in the world that you can think of that has that degree of uh, common understanding, of shared agreement. Um, so we can have remarkably effective internet, self internet industry self-governance. We can have remarkably effective degree of consensus. Um, it evolves. You know, I if you look back 20 years ago, there was a huge amount of contention in the interconnection between networks, right? You, everybody had to write everything down or, uh, you know, they would wing it and find out after the fact that they had, you know, big disagreements about what it was they thought they were doing. Um, so, so this sort of thing, y you can evolve towards consensus. You can evolve towards shared understanding of, of what's right and reasonable. Um, but I think you got to not wait for everybody to get on board because there will always be people who disagree. And, um, you know, you got to decide what you're going to do about uh, people who weren't in the room at the time and trying to make sure everybody knows about it and you operate completely transparently in the open is probably the best answer to that one. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, so, continuing with Olga, uh, your questions are how these trends, uh, how, how are they affecting uh, internet governance processes and practices? Is there more room for government's role? Um, in particular, should governments be held more accountable for the protection of less technologically sophisticated end users? Or is users' vulnerability just a myth? That's an interesting question, I think. And where is the LATAM heading um, to on these issues? The floor you. is yours. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Lorenzo, for the kind invitation. And thanks to the panelists for, it's an honor to be with you today. Um, I, I was, when I was thinking about how to answer this question, I thought that sometimes we try to identify the multi-stakeholderism as itself, as, it, as a concept. And we really sometimes lose perspective of all the examples that we have around uh, that are really multi-stakeholder efforts and are related with the internet governance at a local or regional level. And uh, I brought to you some examples that are, could be interesting to focus, especially in the region where I come from. I, I live in Argentina and I come from Latin America. And uh, Bill just mentioned about the IXPs. I think IXPs are an excellent example of multi-stakeholder effort. Um, all the internet exchange points in my country were built uh, mainly um, by private companies, by internet uh, service providers, providers that wanted to improve their networks and enhance the, <coughs> the traffic exchange. But at the same time, always the government uh, was aware of that and supportive of that, of that initiative, uh, never against and never putting any, any barrier to those companies in gathering together. Now, uh, the situation has evolved a little bit more. In, in my country, there are several. I think there are like 10 uh, internet exchange points and uh, many more in Brazil. There are uh, new ones in other countries. Still, there are some countries in the region that don't have uh, internet exchange points, so that's, uh, that's a space for multi-stakeholder co cooperation with our neighbor countries in, in our region that uh, we could think about. And also, um, in, the, in the last uh, time, there is a regional internet exchange point for, for the whole region. So, um, fiber optics. Latin America, it's a very large and diverse region. We have s very small country, island countries, um, uh, mountains, big countries like Brazil, big countries not so large as Brazil, but big enough like Argentina and others, and a geography that is really very diverse. What happens with our traffic? It's mainly driven through the United States because it's, more, it's cheaper. 
And uh, so focusing on uh, regional connectivity, it's uh, an important issue for our region. Uh, in, in a meeting in, uh, of, uh, of the governments of the South America region in UNASUR uh, last year in March, all the ministries of foreign affairs agreed in trying to build a ring of fiber optics among the, uh, our countries. What happens is that a lot of fiber is being lied uh, today. Uh, in Argentina, uh, the, uh, the government is lying a very big uh, fiber optic network that intends to arrive to all the small cities. The interesting thing about this project is that it does not compete with the small ISPs that are today providing internet service to uh, rural areas. O on the contrary, what the, what the project wants is to bring um, high mm, bandwidth to small uh, places uh, in rural areas and enhance the service that these small ISPs can, can give to their users. So that's another multi-stakeholder of the dynamic internet to, to, to share with you. And also I would like to share with you uh, another interesting project I was involved in. Uh, there is a province in my country called uh, La Pampa, which is in the north of Patagonia. It's a province that has few water. So the province decided to build uh, an aqueduct, bringing water from the north and bringing water to all the small towns. And um, someone in charge of the project thought, like five, six years ago, that it could be interesting to lie fiber along the aqueduct. Interesting thing is that uh, there was a uh, high resistance at the beginning for him to do that uh, from other people in the project. And finally, he got the approvement, and uh, the project only increased 3% of the total cost, including fiber optic with the aqueduct. Now, all the small towns have water, and all the small towns have high bandwidth connectivity. And they are offering this high bandwidth. Uh, they are a public-private company to all the small ISPs and small companies all over the, the, the province, and they are becoming one of the fully connected provinces of my country, and it's not one of the wealthiest provinces. So that's um, a, a nice example. About the users, um, you have, uh, I thought a lot about this question. Um, I think in Latin America, you have two types of users. The ones very included, um, that are fully connected and have access to all the information and, and platforms that they can use, those are perhaps not so much aware of privacy concerns and security concerns. And then you have those which are not so much included. And in that point, I would like to stress also all the projects that are happening in all the countries of Latin America. The largest in the world is happening in Argentina. It's called uh, Conectar Igualdad. The, con the government has given to high school students more than three million computers which is changing the way, it's a, it's a new experiment for everyone, for families, for the teachers and for the, for the schools and for the uh, students, but it's changing the way the families are using the internet and the computers because the kids take the computers to schools. Uh, so, and now the government is facing these uh, security challenges and they are working on building uh, capacity and uh, awareness in the society about how to be careful about the usage of uh, cloud computing, security, and privacy. And that's something that is happening now. I will stop here. Maybe we can add something later. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Olga. Um, so next is Sam Partridge. Partridge. Um, the question to you would be, should governance, governments play a different role in internet governance? What is their responsibility as legislators? So now that uh, key question comes. As more policymakers become active in internet governance, how can the multi-stakeholder model approach best evolve to meet their needs? Um, and do we need more operational definitions of what constitutes good multi-stakeholder approach to internet governments? Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks for reminding the questions. Usually I try and avoid them, but <laughs> you've, you've, you've <laughs> You've nailed me back, so uh, let me see what I can do in 10 minutes. Um, let me take you back about 15 uh, years. Um, at that stage, basically, what we were trying to do was, was take governments out of communications. Um, most governments around the world ran 
their monopoly telecom network, uh, not very well. Uh, penetration was pretty poor. Um, investment generally got diverted into other good causes, you know, to health, education, and telecoms was generally used as a, as a tool often to raise um, taxation, a, a proxy for taxation. So we were at the stage where we were trying to get governments to step back, um, not only from operating networks, but in a sense also governing them because we were trying to create independent regulators to oversee the telecoms market. And along came this thing called the internet, which kind of just slipped through the cracks. Um, a bit of a, a US accident in a way. And we looked at the internet and saw that it was an internet, uh, a network of networks, but also a network of private networks, which I think is an important uh, distinction. Because when we did look at this, we saw that these networks were essentially self-governing. Of course, they were self-governing in, in frameworks that were created by um, the policies, the practices that operated in that country, you know, rule of law and all, all the other things that go along with that. Um, so we asked ourselves a different question. We asked ourselves, you know, what is the role of um, governments? And I'll perhaps say something about that before I say, um, you know, should there be a different role? And essentially we, we decided that this should be um, effectively a private sector driven approach um, because we saw that they were uh, essentially running the networks. And then we learnt about these other institutions that Bill was talking about that, that had emerged, the ITF and all the other uh, institutions that you well know. And we saw there was also an internet technical community and we saw that, that, that this was becoming more and more important uh, to the economy and that there was all, all these other stakeholders that also wanted to say. So we did some of the, pre, the, the work that led up to the US uh, green paper and white paper that led to the creation of ICANN where, at least at that stage, because the internet was mostly in OECD countries, it was, these issues were being considered at the OECD. And ICANN was created and everyone had, was scratching their heads, well, what is the role of, of governments? And so the GAC was created, the, the, you know, to give governments a voice, a way to input policy um, into this basically private process. Um, the GAC's changed a lot over the years and, you know, at the first GAC meeting there was about 15 people there, 15 governments and I guess two or three IGOs. And essentially, the, the, I can remember the, the first issue they were all most concerned with, the governments, was about their CCTLDs, um, how, how, how they should be governed. And effectively, some of them, you know, had territories overseas where there was, you know, the French had the Dom Toms and so forth. And so they sat around the table trying to figure out, well, you know, who, who runs these? Are they legitimate? You know, at that stage, actually, some of them were in jail, some of them with, were in countries where, for various reasons, um, that government couldn't interact with that person in that country. And there was all these... It, it was a very complex and confuse, confusing situation. So that, that was one of the first issues that GAC um, tried to deal with. Now, over time, the, the GAC has evolved, and it's now more than, I think, 100 members of the GAC. Not, not always, you know, everyone can attend, but it's, 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 it, it's kind of mirrored the expansion... Um, of stakeholders in the process in the same way that later the IGF was created also, I think, to, to fill a gap um, that existed for everyone to get together uh, right across the spectrum of all groups that consider um, internet policies and practices. Um, now, if I come to the final question on my list about the, you know, how this, the definition of the multi-stakeholder process is evolving and, and where it should go. I think there's, there's been a lot of tests along the way, but I really think we're at a critical juncture uh, for a lot of the institutions. And that is how they manage public versus private interests. Um, you know, governments have tried really to step back from the process. And it's up to these institutions to see how they can, um, in a bottom-up process, arrive at a conclusion that 
really uh, lends confidence to governments that the process is working. Um, and if they can do that, then I, I, you know, I'm quite optimistic about the future. Um, but there are real challenges. You know, the GAC is really dealing with some very complex and difficult issues. And in some ways, it wasn't designed or resourced to deal with some of those issues. Some of them come from other, uh, you know, directly for the mandates of other international organisations. You know, the GAC is looking at trade issues, which really is the WTO, but because they're trade issues that um, involve uh, domain names, you know, they're, they're being dealt with at the GAC. And it's extraordinarily difficult to deal with these issues um, in the GAC because, one, you've got um, GAC members there that are incredibly taxed at the moment. You know, the new GTLD process has put extraordinary pressure on them because they're, they're getting hit from all sides by all uh, the different stakeholder groups, the interests in their economies and societies in ways that reflect the, the internet itself expanding into those areas. And so I think I, I come back to the, the issue of public interest. You know, can the internet institutions, which are primarily dealing with private networks and private interests, um, arrive at conclusions that uh, deal with public interest in some def very difficult processes? Thank you. Thank you so much. And now the last speaker is Lorenzo. Um, and your questions are the following. Is the more active role of the governments here to stay? Are the principles of the multi-stakeholder approach still valid in this context? Which approach can best respond to the need to match governance issues with the right governance in institutions? How are the more traditional telecommunication companies dealing with the new challenges in internet? And how do they handle the more complex business relationships mentioned in the document of this workshop? Uh, okay, let, first of all, let me thank all the panelists and uh, Linda to accept our invitation to participate to this workshop. Uh, I mean, so far, uh, if we um, compare, you know, if you, the, the words, you know, the frequency of the word that we have heard the most in this uh, uh, almost three days of the of the conference, I think there are basically, uh, there are two words. From one side, Brazil. Brazil, uh, it can be seen as a proxy of a more active role from the government. And from the other side, you know, everybody, of course, is talking about uh, multi-stakeholderism in a different way. Uh, I think I want to uh, start, uh, you know, linking to what uh, Sam just say. We are, uh, uh, we are a re very, critical junction, you know, for this institution, because I, am, I strongly believe that uh, uh, internet, to some extent, also maybe the multi-stakeholder approach model, is to some extent a victim of, of uh, its own success. In other words, has been so successful in a given context, then now, because this context is changing, is changing because of the what uh, uh, Christo Christopher was mentioned, in terms of uh, dynamic internet, uh, but also because some of the players want to uh, play a new role, that we should try to address this issue to find a more sustainable uh, role for all these different players in this institution. Um, role of the government. Um, I am strongly convinced that uh, because this is one of the, uh, you know, of the part of the puzzle, you know, one of the pieces of the puzzle that's changing the most. This is not something uh, uh, that will, give, will go away very soon. In other words, uh, this more um, uh, active role of the government, it's here to stay for at least uh, four, uh, four reasons. The first one, the, the government uh, uh, understood, you know, the increasing uh, importance role of, of internet in everyday life. Um, uh, although uh, there are no what uh, the, mm, you know, the technical people call the kill switch for internet. In other words, nobody can, uh, can you know, block completely the internet, at least in the more developing countries. We definitely uh, realize that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in some cases, like uh, in Egypt, you know, uh, the uh, closing, shutting down of uh, communication had a big impact on, uh, on the... Uh, 
uh, on the production and development GDP, the OECD has estimated this in an impact like uh, on an early basis of between three or four percent of GDP in uh, Egypt during the, during the Arab Spring. Um, and this was, uh, we have to say that the government uh, is realizing this, um, this importance because before, you know, th they were not very active in the, in the, um, uh, you know, in, on this arena. Uh, the second issue, is, as uh, Christopher was mentioning, uh, the fact that uh, uh, internet is becoming more uh, heterogeneous and dynamic uh, will uh, have an impact on, uh, on the, uh, there will be a trend towards a more formal governance. And this will call, you know, by definition almost uh, a more active uh, role of the government. Think about the issue of security, for instance, okay? The third element is more uh, geopolitical. Uh, you know, up to a few years ago, we, there was this book uh, written by Friedman, uh, the, f the World is Flat, you know, and we thought that uh, the globalization at different level, uh, culturally, uh, level of technology at the um, uh, tra trades level was going to win, you know. Now we realize that the proxy for that is this book by, uh, by Kaplan, say, you know, that the geography is having its own revenge because we have uh, seen that instead local uh, components uh, play a, an important role for that. We saw that during the Arab Spring, for instance, we thought the ICT were going to, to spread the freedom to all over Africa, but besides the first moment, this did not happen because later on, the complexity state, the lack of institutional framework and so on, um, you know, created a major problem. It gave more role to the local government, even in the fragmented uh, um, reality of, of this type of countries, but definitely uh, it's giving more role to the government uh, to, to step in. The fourth element is, uh, um, you know, this idea that uh, I strongly believe, if, if you read, um, if you read the, the, the book of um, uh, Eric Smith, uh, Cohen, The New Digital Age, they, they claim that we are already uh, living in an age of state-led cyber war. And, um, even though we are not aware of that. This basically means that all the states are preparing uh, uh, for this war. Probably it's going to have a, a different effect. The, um, uh, the government will play a different role, but definitely will, will have an increasing role. Uh, and so we'll use also ICT for that. Okay. Um, having said that, this basically means that um, as the internet is becoming an essential part of business society, the interests of different governments will become too big to stay out. And since government around the world uh, diverge widely, also the internet perspective become divergent. This means that probably we are in the process of aiding versus uh, uh, some type of uh, national internet. And uh, to some extent, there are some people that say that so far we have been lucky uh, because uh, we, have, uh, we had a uh, a great uh, uh, uniform system, a great unani un unanimity, but exactly because probably the government were not so involved in this process. Uh, but because the world is multifaceted place and uh, the internet is part of the world, uh, this divergence uh, is probably is going to grow. Uh, you know, I was uh, coming here, for instance, I was, uh, uh, I was, you know, I had to stop in Singapore and uh, I was surprised uh, hearing, you know, when uh, from the captain speaking, say, well, uh, we are giving you the, the immigration uh, uh, paper and we remind you the smuggling drugs in Singapore will be punished to the penal uh, capital debt, you know. This, you know, for European that we are uh, talking about, you know, no, a soft, uh, heavy drug, it's, com it's, you know, it's a completely different paradigm. I know that there are people that say you can, uh, if you come to the internet world, you can address this issue through filtering and so on. But definitely there is an issue that uh, uh, there are different ideas on how to, how to handle these matters. And uh, because uh, internet will be also the vehicle to diffuse, for instance, uh, 
video through the cloud TV, the conception of TV of the US, the Iran will uh, definitely uh, will be in strong contradiction. So we have to expect some type of, uh, of a divergence in that. Um, okay, having said that, uh, what, what are then the implication for, for uh, the multi-stakeholder approach? Um, I think that we should, uh, the problem is, I try also um, today not to mention this in other workshop, um, there is this idea of um, um, we should uh, distinguish you know, between uh, um, the idea of uh, equal footing. Uh, in other words, um, if we compare uh, uh, different players, you know, uh, probably we should uh, make clear there is this difference between the shared responsibility and, and the equal, equal responsibility. In other words, uh, probably the way to go is to allow for this diversity, you know, to, to be perceived and incorporated in this process. Because I think quite often we, um, we uh, talk about the ecosystem as like an ideal world. Instead, the ecosystem is, uh, is characterized by prey and predators, death and, and birth to some extent. And so we should, to have a more uh, resilient ecosystem, we should allow for this uh, diversity. And uh, I think we should uh, allow for the different players of, uh, of the, the stakeholder model no? to play a, a different role, a uh, different role according maybe to the different uh, governance issues that need to be addressed. For instance, if we talk about standards, probably the private sector should have the lead. If we talk about uh, internet issues related to particular community, like uh, accessibility, uh, the civil society should have the lead. Um, for instance, uh, if we talk about cybersecurity, you know, before PRISM, I was inclined to say that probably the government should have a major role, but after that I see a big role that can be played, uh, uh, to, uh, can be played by an alliance between the civil society and the private sector to, uh, to um, approach and uh, uh, govern this process. In other words, uh, the idea I will call, uh, I will call this process like a variable geometry governance. In other words, try to understand that, that this new role that some players uh, want to play should, have, uh, should be incorporated in this process. Uh, some people mentioned that this can be done uh, going back to the, to the um, uh, WISIS uh, declaration, you know, but in practice, uh, what does it mean that the, the different players should, uh, should play according to their role? I mean, I think it's, uh, we need, uh, uh, we need uh, more work to be done in this area to clarify, to allow for this type of, uh, of a dynamic. Last things to go to the, the question of, um, of how, how um, companies, private companies are uh, responding to this uh, heterogeneous m internet more dynamic. I think that the idea is to, to work much more towards uh, uh, offering quality of services. And uh, this is also something related to what, uh, to what um, uh, Bill said before. Uh, I think that also the paper that he mentioned uh, was uh, was basically related to the to the uh, you know offering of um, of um, um, basic interconnection best effort for I think that we should also probably promote you know uh, um, agreement among the operator to be able to offer um, you know while they keep uh, the possibility of uh, offering best effort but also to offer quality of services. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. So uh, we've come a long way from government stay away. That's clear from the panel, uh, but not totally clear where we are now. Um, I mean, there is the Tunis delegation uh, declaration that Lorenzo already mentioned where government's role are, are sort of uh, referred to. But uh, that, that's actually all we have. I see from the remote moderator that there are no questions. So I will get up and go around the room and take your questions. Who will go first? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> no, that's too authoritarian. That doesn't belong in this contest, right? <laughs> Thank 
Thank you. I'm most grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Robert Pepper Cisco. Um, so, uh, Robert Pepper Cisco. A, a couple of uh, thoughts. One, um, a couple of thoughts. Uh, Sam, you, you mentioned that you know the uh, almost by accident the internet wasn't regulated in the U.S. Um, actually, why don't I just correct that? Um, the fact that it was not regulated as a telecom or regulated at all at the beginning was a very conscious decision by government to not regulate. Um, it may have not been completely visible outside of the U.S. that that was the decision, but you know I can tell you about meetings where it was discussed and there were decisions made to not regulate. And in fact, to to the contrary to uh, reject calls by the traditional telephone operators to regulate the internet. So it was actually, there were requests to regulate it, and we actually figured out ways to not regulate it, that to regulate it, and we rejected those calls to regulate. Um, now, having, having said that, um, you're right, there were a series or a whole set of voluntary uh, groups that were dealing with issues that um, were not necessarily visible to the people outside of that community, right? The IETF, um, uh, probably being the most important one at that time uh, in terms of working on the standards questions. So, you know, the, the, the issues that, um, Lorenzo, you raised, it, you know, your four points, I think I would agree with, but I guess the question is, when we think about the appropriate roles of governance today, where are the appropriate places to have those decisions made? Um, and the, the fact is that there, there are, because the internet fundamentally is very empowering, there are some governments that support the internet in the empowerment of citizens, but there are other governments that are very, very afraid of that. So there are some governments that are engaged in conversations very well intentioned about how do we collectively solve problems, but they understand that government by itself is maybe not the best place to do that or the best way to do that. But there are other governments that may not be as well intentioned because in fact, they are afraid of the internet um, because it is so empowering of citizens. How do you distinguish between those two groups of governments and intentions um, when we're talking about a process that started out with little g governance that had nothing to do with governments? as we evolve this in the, and increase the role of government. And by the way, Sam, the, the, the GAC is I think, a great example of an appropriate role. It's a very important role, and it's a growing role, right? But as part of an overall process. It's not a substitute, one or the other. Thank you very much. Who wants to go first? I now see that there is a mic, so I can come back to you. Um, I actually agree with you. So. Bob, <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. The US did um, take a conscious decision not to regulate. So if, if it came across that I was saying that, that's not what I meant. Um, and the, the classic example here is, is VoIP. Um, you know, about 1996, we had a petition from, I think, I can't remember which group in the US it was, who basically petitioned the FCC to do something about VoIP. We just had vocal the first VoIP services starting to be launched. And we had a, a workshop around that stage. And um, we had the various players. We had the US entity whose name I forget. They were a pretty small in net industry group. I can't remember who their name. Um, Ag Ag that Ag Ag yeah. OK. Over and and <laughs> we had them, and we had the um, Israeli company that invented, or at least put the first public service on the internet. 
and we had a guy called Jeff Pulver. Yep. And, 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 and Jeff, Jeff, Jeff thought, hey, this thing's a pretty good idea, this idea of getting people together to talk about this stuff and went off and, and made millions um, with a conference series in, in the US. So, but I just want to make the point that I actually agree with you and it was a conscious decision by the US government not to uh, regulate this, to see, see how it evolved. Yeah. And what about the question regarding the two different uh, profiles of governments? Can I? Can I comment? Uh, I think it's a very interesting differentiation and uh, thinking that way. Um, and uh, I would refer to this decision about Brazil and, and, and ICANN doing this summit. I think it's, a, it's an interesting reaction, an open meeting to discuss things instead of uh, taking other um, more restrictive uh, measurements. Um, so I would say that in general, Latin America is, is I think it's an area of, of the world that is pro-internet and empowering people through the internet. And I would like to take some comments that, that Sam did about the GAC. I think the GAC is really stressed with a, a, a high level of things to review and to, I myself, being a GAC member, have to now review information about um, different uses of these TLDs, uh, maybe uh, from um, uh, names related with regions or um, geographic denominations, and how does this relates with uh, uh, trademarks and um, denominaciones de origen? How do you say that in English? Um, the, the, the thing we have with one and, and one and all that. There's a name in English that doesn't come to my mind in this moment. So this is extremely complex for all, for the people that goes to the GAC and has to deal and understand many things that usually don't um, deal with. But uh, at the same time, we are doing a real important effort in, in trying to, to support all the multi-stakeholder multi process in ICANN. Uh, that's my comment for the moment. Um, I, I think that... Um one of the things that I'm extremely uncomfortable about in this conversation is we talk about the government as if it is going to have a uniform presence across all these issues, when in fact the issues are very, very different. So I'll make a funny statement as an American. In one sense, for this forum, PRISM was a very good thing. Because in a sense, it was all about ICON and GAC. You know, we're talking about domain names as the world. And that has a certain multi-stakeholder set of interests that makes sense. Security should be very different. Uh, privacy should be different. Uh, the Edno proposal and the Wicked about interconnection could be very different. And we have to bear in mind that, in fact, we the, the real flexibility of these solutions is we shouldn't necessarily think of a single venue or presume that the same venue will resolve all those different issues because the valences are so different, we should probably design individual processes for each. But we also have to bear in mind what Bill said, which is he said, sometimes this is done through bilateral negotiations and that individual institutions have choices whether to choose to do a multilateral solution or a, multi, a private multi-stakeholder solution or bilaterally, and that that choice is endogenous based on what those actors think is going to be in their selfish best interest at any one time. Now, that will not lead to results that some people will like, but that is the nature of Internet governance where basically um, if you cannot participate in the system the way you like, you can private network, you can do all these exit options that always remain there or ask for specialized services that will provide you with the privacy, security, or quality of service you need. So we have to take in mind that, in fact, if this sorts of whatever the solutions are going to be, it has to work for all the interested parties, and that has to be taken into account. Just something that um, I thought maybe bears reiterating here um, for those who, don't, who haven't thought about it, which is that um, the Internet is... Uh, growing exponentially. It's been doubling in size every 10 and a half months for 30 years. Um, uh, governance of any sort is a utility, and uh, the utility governs, sorry, the utility constrains the rate of growth of the thing governed, right? So if you're looking at a city, a city can't successfully grow if its governance structures don't grow along with it, right? If you don't have additional schools, if you don't have additional trash collection, if you don't have additional firefighters, 
all these services of government. Uh, but, but primarily what governance is, is the resolution of problems that are unexpected or the creation of new policies to fit new situations, uh, the resolution of problems between people who wouldn't otherwise be able to agree. Anyway, all, all of these things scale along with the size of the thing being governed. So the amount of governance available is a constraining factor on the growth of the thing being governed. And if we wanted to have a sort of boring linear growth, relatively small network like the 20th century uh, voice mm -hmm. telephone network, we could have a single monolithic governance organization, right? And it would grow as fast as any one organization can grow um, and, you know, would hire new people and train them and so forth and we'd have linear growth. But that's not what we have. We have an internet that grows exponentially, which means we need exponential growth in governance. And we have that. And the way we have that is because we have individual governance organizations which each grow and we have growth in the number of uh, internet governance organizations, right? So you multiply those two linear growth factors together and you get exponential growth. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have exponential growth. So we cannot retreat from that to something that centralizes governance or concentrates governance or even retains the status quo and still continue to have the level of growth in the internet that everyone in the last 30 years has become accustomed to. Thank you very much. Now we have a question. Could I get the mic, please? It's there. Oh, please go ahead. Thanks. Peter Dengate Thrush. I just wanted to give you a historical uh, comment to add to the John Perry Barlow um, reference, which comes up a lot, and I think rightly so. First of all, I think is John's basically withdrawn from that himself. He, he says, uh, you, get older, you get older and you get wiser. I think he's on record. But there's also been a very good rebuttal published by that in the last six or seven months. I was trying to find it before to see if I could share it with you. Somebody's gone basically and said, um, you know, we like to be governed. We, the internet community, they just turn around and say, and, and you might like to find that if you can. I just also wanted to pick up the point about, about the multifaceted nature of governments. And, and we, you do have to bear that in mind when you're talking about the government or even the GAC. Uh, we had an example in New Zealand recently where we had um, the education department came down very heavily changing the rules on registration and what they would fund by way of registration for students at the polytechnics. And what it, what it amounted to was that the polytechnics were constrained to only register students in their own geographic region. Meanwhile, the IT department had been completely pushing for an, uh, an electronic form of governance and wanted students to enrol online from all over the country, two completely conflicting policies. Um, and so government's not monolithic, and we see that. And the other point really is the, the issues that, uh, that where that comes up in the GAC is to take the sort of examples. You've, we've just been having a trademark law discussion, and prior to that we were having a sovereignty and, and jurisdiction law in relation to CCTLDs, etc. So it, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> but the major point I want to make really is about why we have it, and it's, it's, it he, it's, it's the power to arrest and imprison. Why, why contracts work in the civilised world is that if you don't honour the contracts, the person who's got their contract broken, so we, we say we've got a civil law and people behave, but the reality is you can go to a court and the court will order one of the parties to perform or pay, take a penalty and if they continue not to follow the court's orders, then they get arrested not for the breach of contract but for breaching the court order. And if you breach a court order long enough, you'll eventually get arrested and in some countries you can be executed. And so the difficulty we have in, in creating internet governance systems is to find what is the underlying power to compel. And the trouble is that it tends to be um, turning people off, taking away their domain names, taking away their, their, their access. And so what we've done is we've put that power to compel into a number of different hands. And I think that's a useful area for further study is who actually has that power of denying access basically or, or limiting or closing or uh, impinging access. And how well are they controlled and what rules are they using to, to exercise that? Thanks. I'd like to just respond to that really quickly. I think one of the interesting things about the internet is that as a network of networks, it is specifically the network of other internet protocol speaking networks, right? We are a very loose agglomeration of people who agree to abide by the same rules. Anyone who doesn't abide by those rules is by definition not part of the internet, right? So 
you know, we've got these walled garden, you know, mobile carrier private networks out there that are just barely connected to the internet. You know, they're just barely following the same set of rules. They have a gateway between them and the rest of the internet, and the rules on the other side of their gateway are different, but they manage to translate them at the edge to make themselves palatable and make themselves part of the consensus that we operate under. So th that kind of goes two ways, right? That on the one hand, yes, you can say the power of government is the power to execute or exclude or whatever, but at the same time, it is the decision of each participant to participate, to follow the same set of rules. And when they choose not to, if you choose not to follow the IETF protocols, you will not be interoperable. And physical connectivity is completely beside the point, right? If you choose not to follow the IEEE rules, you won't have Ethernet working, right? And each set of rules that you choose not to follow, each set of each portion of the consensus that you disagree with takes you one step further away from being part of the same network. And so, I mean, this, this has two sides, and I see it as being a uh, much more humane system than the physical world one in which governments do have to execute people sometimes, so some of them, and where people do not have much choice about what set of rules or the degree to which they want to follow those rules, right? I mean, if you don't like the rules in Singapore, you can walk across the causeway to Malaysia and have a different set of rules, but there are only a limited number of sets of rules that you can choose to abide by. Whereas in the internet, if you don't like it, find a bunch of other people who agree with you and go off and do your own thing. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is uh, Ana Olmos. I'm a researcher, and I wanted to comment, I also belong to the Spanish IGF, so I've had some experience trying to build multi-stakeholder groups and discussions, and um, I, I wanted to say that I really liked how, how uh, Christopher, you spelled out the characteristics of the informal governance, and I got, it got me thinking, because you said things like small size, uh, people who see the, each other frequently, that there's some homogeneity to it, and um, uh, translating that to my own experience, at the IGF, which I've been going to for years now, uh, as open and inclusive as it tries to be, with all the multi-stakeholderism and all the workshops, thousands of workshops, and even with all of that, there's a lot of the informal governance going on at the, at the same time. And uh, this year, particularly, Twitter has been uh, has been you know saying things like there are closed meetings that I cannot have access to. People are saying things like the important things are happening in the hallways and uh, who is participating in those things is people who feel like they are a close-knit community, people who see each other frequently, not only at the IGF, but at the many other meetings that uh, these stakeholders also uh, are involved in throughout the year. So um, I just wanted to add that this was a, you know, a helpful perspective in understanding things that are going on right now, even though we try to grow to make it bigger, at the same time, we're still enhancing the, this, that you know, close-knit community feeling. And if you take that to another step, if you look in international law, they actually think about things not just in terms of multilateralism and bilateralism, but also regionalism. It could be that we, in trying to find grand solutions to some of these things, they don't necessarily have to be that way. And that's quite striking to me. Um, even though the gentleman just left, the one other comment I wanted to make is about the power of the state. Um, yes, the power of the state is always there and is strong. There's a John o James Austin, there's a long school of thought that believes that's what matters. The other saving grace, in addition to what Bill said, is that if the, if the state has to exercise that power, it's generally lost. I mean, it's, it can't execute everybody. It's like, you know, there's, I'm, I'm a parent, there's punishments, if you have to impose them, you know you've lost. I mean, that, the point of that was not that, or if you have to foreclose on someone's house to get your money back, that's not a win for you. That's the OSI model of government. Yeah, well, that is the OSI model, and that's what failed. And the point I would make is that, in fact, when we think about the role of governments, we have to understand that, in fact, they are not just a coercive force, that, in fact, if they have to resort to that, this is a failed solution to them, and that they're much more likely to be constructive, and they'd much more likely, they would love it if private entities could solve some of these problems and just make them go away. And so I actually think that the government actually uh, isn't the, I have a lot, there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful about the role of government in addition. 
Thank you very much. Um, more questions, please? Well, in that case, I don't know if the panelist wants to say a few famous last words before we wrap up. I want to just uh, respond a bit to the question of uh, uh, Bob Pepper, you know, ask me. Um, I understand that there is this uh, difference, let's say, on tone, you know, among the governments. But uh, uh, first of all, what I try to do is, uh, because of that, because there are, exactly because there, are, there is this difference among governments, it's important to, to talk about that and make these differences. Otherwise, you know, we are sa all say, oh, all the government are the same, and uh, we don't understand that uh, what's happening now, even the, uh, f for instance, personally, I'm, I'm confident, I know that uh, uh, if at the WTPF, you know, probably would ever discuss the, the motion of from Brazil, probably we didn't have now this, uh, the, this meeting in, uh, in May, you know, as has been planned, because probably there was a uh, room for, uh, for uh, this player to play, to have a different role. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, in terms of multi-stakeholder, we should uh, think about allowing, again, a, a more dynamic among the players, and try to match, you know, uh, to match the different uh, players with, the, with each uh, governance issue. The problem of the locus, where is the place where we should discuss? For instance, today, uh, Wolfgang was saying, Probably we'll need, I don't know, an informal uh, council of multi-stakeholders. They will uh, suggest, uh, not impose, but suggest place uh, where discuss some issues, even, even to some extent, who should uh, take the lead uh, on some specific issues, for instance. No, and I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think one of the um, problems that we've seen and why we have some reactions by some governments that are very well-intentioned is that there are people who talk about multi-stakeholder approach, but they don't include governments as a legitimate participant in a multi-stakeholder multi approach. Uh, you know, it, a multi-stakeholder approach is a multi-stakeholder approach. Everybody needs to be able to be, have a seat at the table, including governments, because of the appropriate roles of, for, for governments, right? And you know, in the early days of the IGF, um, in fact, well, you can go to some of the regional IGF meetings, and there's virtually no government participation, right? We need, which, you know, um, I don't know whether that's because they don't care in those regions or because they feel that they're not, that they're not welcome. Um, if you take a look at the participation, uh, even this week here, and it's a lot better than in the past, there's really not a broad-based participation by governments globally um, as participants Right in a multi-stakeholder um, uh, environment and and process, I think that. So the, the short answer is yes, I agree with you. And then we need to think about from the conversations here, where does it go, and who's the most appropriate, you know, actors and places. But one of the things that the internet has enabled is broader participation at virtually in virtually every venue, right. Uh, whether it's a traditional government venue or, you know, even in, in um, business, as we know, right? So I think that what we need to be doing is thinking in a very forward way about using the model of the Internet, which is decentralization, the advantages of what we've seen in the Internet governance, which was, you know, the overused phrase of permissionless innovation, which actually worked, um, and yet figure out where indeed we need a role for government, and there is one. In fact, he reminded me, um, was what I was looking at, the um, di uh, presidential directive in 1997 from President Clinton, right, which sort of laid all this out, right? It's on, it's on the web, um, and, it, and it specifies things for the U.S. government, you know, the Department of Commerce to do, to facilitate um, uh, the Internet, um, and things that he had directed the, the government to do to um, uh, protect. So, you know, uh, 
in terms of, for example, uh, standard setting. Uh, you know, he says, um, I direct the Secretary of Commerce to support private sector development of technical standards for the internet and the U.S. Trade Representative to oppose efforts by foreign governments to impose standards or to use standards for electronic commerce as non-tariff trade barriers. Right? I think we all accept that now. Or not everybody, but I think everybody in the panel would accept that and, and most of the people in this room. Um, so it was, but it was, other, it was very clear also that there were things that needed to be done um, by government. For example, he directed the Secretary of Commerce to do things that would facilitate the growth of the Internet it wasn't regulating it. There is enablement. The government has a lot of different roles um, in commerce, um, in the in internet, everything that doesn't mean regulation. A role for government doesn't mean doesn't always equal regulation. And sometimes we lose sight of that in the conversations. So a few short comments because we're running out of time. Yeah. Regarding uh, governmental participation in multi-stakeholder processes, I mean, you and I have both dealt with a lot of governments, and I think it's fair to say that more times than not, government is the one who shows up after the fact and wants a veto, right? Sometimes they're participatory. Sometimes they lead by example. Sometimes they're very forward-thinking. But more often than not, it's quite the opposite, right? So saying what can the multi-stakeholder governance process do to ensure governmental participation is, it seems to me, putting the responsibility in the wrong place. That, that's fair. I'll, uh, sorry, sorry, okay. sorry. Really quickly, so the one thought I keep having, though, in response to Anna's comments, which is sometimes I don't think these little small conversations are a bad thing because um, in a way IGF, I think, is growing up in the sense that we sometimes can make small solutions, but I'm also reminded of a big movement in the U.S., which was Occupy Wall Street. And when they generated tremendous political pressure, they then tried to find leaders to say, well, what do you want? And because the organization was committed to this very open structure, there was no one to answer that question, and all the possible force they had didn't work. And so in a way, there has to be some internal structure if IGF, which has gone on for eight years, is going to start making the next step from de formulating options and debating to start uh, to having the serious discussion of, of debating uh, policy alternatives. Thank you. Did you want to come back, Bob? Sorry. Uh, uh, just to, um, to support Bill's point and uh, with uh, actually go be a little bit beyond that, which is the following. Um, I remember there was an IGF in Nairobi where there were complaints by governments saying there are other governments that are not here. Um, and we asked, probed why. And it turned out that those other governments were not comfortable coming to a meeting where they were not given preferential treatment over the other players. In a multi-stakeholder environment, everybody is equal. These were governments, um, non-democratic governments in this case, that did not want to come where they would have to have conversations with people who were not in other governments. They just didn't understand that, and they didn't understand when some governments came to a meeting why the tables were not set up with the nameplates by in French by governments, and that's how people sat. And when they wanted to speak, you raised your card. They thought it was a UN meeting, right? And there's a it's a it's a different culture, and uh, so I would agree that with Bill, it's not always the fault. But I think that in some cases, in some places, they we have not done enough to make the Friendly, you know, the governments that are sympathetic feel comfortable enough in an environment to which they are not yet used to. So thank you very, very much to the distinguished panel for your participation. It's been very, very interesting. I'm just sorry we had no remote questions, but uh, that is often the case. So uh, hopefully in the future people will feel more empowered to come in uh, from, from outside. Uh, especially because that's when it gets truly, you know, multi-stakeholder. So thank you very, very much and have a good continued stay. Thank you.